I'd like to welcome Jeffrey Sauer. So we sort of have it set up like a, a Wayne State version of the set the actor studio. <laughs> <laughs> I sent the question to your assistant and said, I don't know if he does not want to know in advance, he'd rather go off the cuff. I don't think there's any problem with this question. So thank you. I thought we'd just start talking because you are a Michigan native. Yes, sir. Uh, from both part. Um, what in your upbringing sort of led you to this desire to produce? Was, was there a pivotal moment or was it like a progressive? Uh, I think this, I just want to contextualize this for you and for me to say um, that one, I'm really happy to be here with you. Um, I'm happy by um, the intimacy of this crowd, and um, and I want you to feel free to ask any kind of question that you want um, in this really nice intimate space, because I feel like we can be a little bit warmer and a little bit closer today than uh, some of the other events I do that are um, bigger. And, and um, I have a memory of actually seeing a little production in this space of uh, 10 Little Indians, uh, when a friend of mine who was a Wayne State uh, student I was in that production when I was uh, um, back in high school in like 1982 or something like that. So it's also fun to be in this theater. Um, so the first thing that happened, uh, I, I never know how far back to go with these things, but I'm going to go all the way to the beginning, which is that I have two really strong, positive memories. Um, I was a camper at a day camp in Oak Park, Michigan, when I was about eight or nine. And uh, we used to congregate. It was an outdoor day camp at Oak Park. And, um, and then that summer, the high school kids um, at the high school were doing like a summer musical. And they, 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 were, they made an original musical out of Uncle Stilsky. And they called it Rump. <laughs> and it was a rock musical of Rumble Still. This is like probably in 1973 or something. And I remember as a camper going to see Rump at the Little Theater at Oak Park High School. And I remember being completely um, transported um, by that experience. And, um, and then the following summer, the same group of, of high school kids at Oak Park High School. Um, did a new musical of Robin Hood. And my memory of that production was that they built a small pool on the stage uh, that I think like Robin Hood pushed Friar Tuck into or something like that. <laughs> and, um, and those have been very strong memories for me. Then when I was in the fourth grade, I don't even know why, I, I guess I must have taken this next action because I like those shows, but um, at my temple, at Temple Israel, um, they used to do a Purim play, and they would juxtapose the story of Queen Esther against a Broadway musical. And so there was a very creative theater director who was making these plays, and, um, and I loved going to see the Purim play every year. I don't remember what it was that year before, but there was an audition and I had never auditioned for anything in my life. I had never read a uh, speech out loud in my life in fourth grade. And I went to the audition and I didn't read very well, but I, so they put me in the chorus. And that year they were um, using South Pacific so that Queen Esther would sing about King Ahasuerus, I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and, they also, I guess they decided they were not going to make the sailors sing There's Nothing Like a Dame because we were in fourth grade. And so then they decided to bring into that musical um, HMS Pinafore, Gilbert and Sullivan. So I was with these sailors in white sailor suits singing We Sail the Ocean Blue and Our Saucy Ships of Beauty. And in fourth grade, that was my introduction to Rodgers and Hammerstein and Gilbert and Sullivan. So that was a good start. And um, doing the play was so fun that 
literally the Monday after the sun, you know, for one performance thing, you do it on Purim Sunday, and uh, then you go to the carnival after, because Purim's often accompanied by a carnival. Um, and, uh, uh, and right after that, I was sitting in my classroom in the fourth grade in English class, and I wrote a play. I just started writing. I literally, I just started, uh, and I called it Adventureland. And I started with what I knew, which is I had two best friends, Bruce and Jay. And we used to always play in my backyard or their backyards. And we'd go out on the woodshed and uh, jump up onto the woodshed roof in my backyard. And Bruce was kind of a destructive young fellow. And uh, he would rip the tar shingles off of the woodshed. And then after he ripped them off, he would whip them into the backyard next door like a frisbee. <laughs> so then we would go along and do it too. And then with the passage of the summer, there would be less and less shingles on the top of the roof. This is the true part. And um, uh, so as I started writing the play, I started with the scene that would all three of us go on the roof. And then what I did is took the dramatic leap to write that um, after too many shingles had been removed, we fell through the roof. And instead of falling onto the floor of the woodshed, we fell into a whole new uh, mystical land that I called Adventureland. And in that land, we were beset by many um, life-threatening obstacles. Um, you know, uh, uh, villains that wanted to kill us, mm -hmm developers that were moving trees out, and, um, and, I, and I incorporated Saturday morning cartoon characters that I liked, so like Aquaman was in it. Like, like, I, had, um, I, had, like I had the Marvel thing down before they ever did. <laughs> it was 1973, and, and um, Aquaman was in it, Daniel Boone was in it, um, uh, and then... Um, uh, Captain Hook and, and, and Peter Pan saves his the end and flies his home. And, and that was my fourth grade play. And then in fifth grade, my fifth grade teacher uh, basically gave us a workshop and we got to stage it in class <laughs> and with my friends. And um, so I was hooked. And then I was in the core play again in sixth grade. Uh, that year, it was a bunch of cowboys landing in Chushan in a spaceship. So, and, um, and then in seventh grade, I I'm gonna get to the answer to your question. <laughs> I have not, let, I've not lost the thread. And, and then in seventh grade, um, I found, I, I auditioned at the Community Theater Stagecrafters, which was at that time up in Colossal, Michigan, up on Main Street and 13 or 14 Mile. And uh, they were doing this play in which they needed, like it was an adult play, but they needed two kids. And I went and auditioned for the play. It was called Speaking of Murder. And it was one, uh, some, a silly murder mystery in which the setup is that they're gonna, um, the person who's gonna try to commit the murder is also gonna try to pin it on a nine-year-old boy. So I tried out and I played the nine-year-old boy. Great experience. That's seventh grade. And they had a youth theater group. And it was called the Ragamuffins. And I joined the youth theater group. And I was in a play with the youth theater group at Up at Stagecrafters. And um, I and, and, and they would do plays that were very appropriate for kids that were often licensed from the Anchorage Press or the Dramatic Publishing Company of Chicago that had a good catalog of children's plays. And, uh, uh, and I... After I was in like one play there, I went, who picks the play? <laughs> and they said, oh, the play reading committee. And I said, I want to be on the play reading committee. <laughs> and within, by the time I'm in eighth grade, I'm the chairman of the play reading committee. <laughs> and I'm picking the play. And um, that was my first action as a producer. <laughs> and then... Um, I was good, like, uh, for a 13-year-old, I was, like, kind of good at calligraphy and stuff like that. So I said, I'll do the programs. So I would uh, make the flyer and the program for the play that we were doing. And, um, and then I started writing the press releases for our, our, our little youth theater plays that we would send out to, like, the Royal Oak Tribune and those different local publications announcing the show. 
And then I said, oh, and then we needed to raise a little money for the program. So I would walk through the businesses in Clawson and Birmingham soliciting ads for the program. Like, if you give me your business card for 20 bucks, we'll put your ad in the program. <laughs> so here's what I'm doing. I'm marketing the show. I'm raising money for the show. And I'm picking the show. I'm not yet in puberty, but I am a producer. <laughs> And that's how I came to be the guy who's looking at the forest instead of the trees. Mm -hmm. So what was the leap? Uh, you didn't come to play. That's perfectly What you have been, what was that problem? What, did you find your community here? Did you find the group of people that could help you leap to the next place? You're bringing up a great question about like where we go and why we go there. And, and um, I had, so I, so I was doing theater all through high school, both at Stagecrafters at Oak Park High School, where we, uh, my junior year, we finally got our theater program back up and running with a great um, theater guy named Doc Silverman. His name was N. Paul Silverman. He had a PhD in education, but he was an actor and a director and we started doing shows again my junior year. My junior year, we did Pajama Game, and then we did Fight First People, and I was in Fight First People with four other people. And that was the first year in many years that Oak Park High School went to the thespian competition. And like we won the first competition, and then we lost the second one, and I was absolutely convinced that it was totally rigged, the second one, because Southfield Lathrop posted it, and they were only, they were like the, the wild card to even get to the second one, and then suddenly they win the second one, and we lose, and I'm like, they won because their set was better. Anyway, these grudges. <laughs> if you're in the theater, a grudge will last for the rest of your life. Anyway, um, so we're doing theater in high school as well, and, um, and between and then I and then another kid told me um, during um, sophomore year that she had just done this high school conservatory program they do for kids in between junior and senior of high school at Northwestern called the National High School Institute of Performing Arts. Uh, in short, it's called the Chero program. And I said, I got to go with that. And I applied. And by the way, we had no money. It was probably twelve hundred dollars. But I think that Northwestern gave me a grant for like. Seven or eight hundred dollars, and all my friends said it was like three or four hundred bucks. So I went to Northwestern that summer in between junior and senior year, and that was my first experience with like a conservatory training and acting where we would spend, you know, we did, did the movement class in the morning, and the vocal class, and the acting class, and the history class, and we were all in a play. We did rehearse that at night, and um, and there were kids from all over the country, and that was my first experience of really looking and going. Ah, uh, wow, there's some really talented kids here and some that I knew were more talented than me as an actor. Even though I, you know, I, I hadn't made any decisions yet, even though I was producing shows in high school. And, um, and what that left me going into senior year of high school was a firm decision that I would not want to go to a BFA conservatory style training program and that I would apply to a, a liberal arts school. And that's kind of what led me to Michigan, because I decided um, from that experience that I wanted to get a liberal arts education. So I'll go to Michigan for that. And, you know, back then, Michigan didn't have a great theater department uh, in 1982. Um, it, had a, it had the beginning of, its, of its, what became its fantastic musical theater program, but it, hadn't been, it was not yet fantastic. It was, um, it was before that really had gotten off the ground. But what I really went there for is for my um, liberal arts education. And I um, studied poli sci. Um, but at Michigan, I um, did, I, I was able to get my work study money doing props for the opera department. So I worked on some opera shows doing props so I could get my 400 bucks a semester from work, work study. And um, I was the performing arts supervisor at Camp Tamarack up in Ortonville, where I taught the, um, the drama kids who were going into ninth grade. We would do two plays every summer. So I was directing two shows every summer. Um, and I was in some shows. And then by junior year, I was directing Soft Show at Michigan and um, directing for Ann Arbor Civic Theater. 
And um, my best friend in college was Andrew Lippa, the composer lyricist. And um, Andrew and I, he was music directing, I was directing. And, um, and then I said to Andrew, right around his freshman, my sophomore year, or somewhere around there, I said, you know, Andrew, you, um, you play piano and you like musicals, so you should write a musical. And I said, I'll write the lyrics. And he wrote a musical in college. It was called Jack the Giant Killer. This was before Into the Woods. <laughs> um, no grudge there. <laughs> I liked Into the Woods. Um, I loved Into the Woods. And uh, um, so Andrew and I had this theatrical partnership that was going. And um, that theatrical partnership was essential to my future. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wound up producing almost everything Andrew did when he got to New York. And Andrew and I got to New York a year apart, and then we started doing stuff together. Like, we got jobs directing community theater for a temple on the Upper West Side. So we would do, for them, Perfectly Frank and Milk and Honey by Jerry Norman, mm because -hmm. they were a temple. And then um, we had done a show at the Performance Network in Ann Arbor for a young people's theater around Ann Arbor called Show Tales. And um, it was five Yiddish folk tales. Uh, uh, Wiseman of Hell, something by Shalom Aleichem, something by Peretz. And uh, Andrew got to New York, started doing the BMI Musical Theater Workshop, met some other composer lyricists, the lyricists. And uh, I went to Andrew and said, hey, why don't we make Shadow Tales into a musical? We'll get Road of Shalom to pay for it, and we'll rehearse for free in their basement. And so I put together like $20,000 and we did Shadow Tales and we made it into a musical called The Pound of Feathers. And that musical I directed and produced. And this was in, this was when I was 25 years old in 1989. And those were the seeds of my professional development. And um, soon after that experience, I, I was working by day as a booker in a Broadway producer's office where I, my job is to like book the national tour cabaret starring Joel Gray in the presence of the Fisher Theater or the Cleveland Playhouse Square Foundation or the Boss Hall in Red Rapids. And um, I would do that by day, run out to do my shows at night with my friends and um, it was in the fall of 90 that a friend of mine said, I'm going to see this rock monologue. Do you want to go with me? And I thought, rock monologue? <laughs> I've never heard that before. Like, I never heard of someone putting together the idea of doing rock songs in a monologue. I was like, that sounds cool. So let's go. And we go up into this small performance space, the brick wall and the piano and the band, you know, bass, drums, piano. Or, you know, the band comes out, sits down. Guy comes out, tall guy, really black hair. Big ears. <laughs> and it was Jonathan Larson. And he was doing the show you probably know, what was Tick Tick Boom. But uh, on that day, it was still called Over This. And that was his show in which he was expressing his frustrations as a 29 year old theater artist who's writing rock musicals that nobody wants to produce. <laughs> and he's asking that question. And it's a question you're all going to ask yourself at some point, which is should I keep writing rock musicals that nobody wants to produce? Should I stay with the girlfriend who I feel safe with? but I know she is not the right woman for me. Uh, should I continue to live down on Greenwich Street in the fourth floor walk-up where the bathtub is genuinely in the kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> or should I take this copywriting job that I'm being offered at a Madison Avenue ad agency and start to finally make a few dollars so I can live a little easier and not have to do all those things and, of course, work as a waiter at a time. And that was the narrative of Tick, Tick, Boom. And, of course, that narrative was all playing on the precipice of his 30th birthday. And um, after I saw that show bawling 
from the notion that this man who I have never met is telling my story. And he's telling it with these songs that were making the hair on my back stick. So um, I think I went to the party after, and maybe I shook his hand, but I was shy. And uh, I wrote him a letter the next day saying, Dear Jonathan, my name is Jeffrey, and I want to produce your shows. And that was in 1990, and Rank opened in 1996. Um, the relationships that you forge right now in college and in the immediate years thereafter are going to define your professional life. Um, Lynn Manuel Miranda was a freshman at Wesleyan when Thomas Kale, the director, was a senior. And uh, what's actually true, they really didn't know each other there. And there's this funny story of like all the kids at Wesleyan had shared the same theater, you know, often the same day and stuff. And at one point, Tommy's trying to do his show as a senior, and he hears that this freshman screwing with his lights. And he's really pissed, and that freshman was wearing that well. He's like, Who the hell is this? Get him out of here. Um, and, uh, uh, but that was how they interacted at Wesleyan. But of course, very shortly after they both graduated, they hooked up and started doing shows together in the basement of the Drama Bookshop on West 40th Street in New York. And um, if you go back in history, uh, Hal Prince met Stephen Sondheim when they were both in their 20s at the opening night of South Pacific on Broadway in, the, in like 1945. They met through their common friend, Mary Rogers. Um, and uh, those part, and, and of course, I'm going to give you one more example, which is that um, Angela Weber and Cameron McIntosh, both contemporaries of each other, uh, met uh, like three years or two years before they did Cats together in the West End in 1981. These are all great examples of the kinds of meetings that define careers. And I have gotten so far away from the question about a liberal arts education that uh, <laughs> no, it was all about trajectory and how you do it. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> work in your but uh, so that, that's my trajectory. And it's, and it's all about um, artistic partnerships. Yeah. Excuse me, Brad. And I'm guessing most people in the room grew up, which hurts to hear, uh, probably sitting along that cast recording in their home. Um, at what point in that show's process, because it is so pivotal to this generation of theater goers, theater makers, at what point did you know this is a thing that's going to come to Oh, yeah. Um, well, you know, what's so fascinating to keep something. Not fascinating, but moving to me is that my own life is kind of defined uh, on before rent and after rent. My entire <laughs> life, like, before rent and after rent, and, and that um, because rent changed my life. Um, and uh, as you know, Jonathan died, and uh, I'm still. Breathing. But um, we never knew. That's the, uh, the, the real answer is that, you know, Jonathan said to me very shortly after we met and, you know, tried to make Tick Tick, uh, uh, both of days in our show. And my biggest contribution to that was I told him to change the title to Tick Tick Broom. So that was a good contribution. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I got him to rewrite the opening number, which went from Boho Days, this is the life of oh, Boho Days, to 39. It was a pretty good number. I said, after you wrote that, wow, you wrote like a Billy Joel opening number. That sounds great. <laughs> and uh, um, and we never, I was never able to get Tick Tick Boom off the ground as an off Broadway show back in that day. It happened after, you know, posthumously after he died. And, um, and, 
So during, it was somewhere during that, you know, that phase in the early nineties, he said, I'm, I, oh, I had said to him once, I want to do Don Giovanni in Harlem as a Don Juan musical. Would, 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 does that sound interesting to you, to you to write? And he goes, I'm not sure I want to do that, but I'm going to do La Bolette in the East Village in which Mimi has AIDS instead of tuberculosis and everybody has AIDS. And I loved that immediately. And um, another big memory of mine was in sixth grade for $4, our entire sixth grade music class went to the music hall to see the Michigan Opera Theater production of La Boulin. So I always kind of had La Boulin inside me. So when he said La Boulin in East Village, I said, yes. And uh, he did the first reading. Uh, the first time it was read out loud, it was in 1993. And we got, he got near Theater Workshop to do the reading. And um, there was no air conditioning. And it was like a 90 degree day. It was really hot. And it went on for like three hours. And uh, some of the songs were there, but the plot was not yet there. It was more like a collage. And uh, I brought two people to see that first reading. A guy I was working with in this uh, group. By that point in my life, I had started my own booking agency with my partner, my business partner, Kevin. And so now we were booking shows for producers directly, not being employees. And, uh, um, and I brought a guy who was working with me who was also ambitious and smart. And then I brought this other guy who was this, frankly, he was a rich kid from Australia. He had a lot of money. And he was my age, and maybe a little younger, but I thought if we're going to get anything off the ground, we're going to need some rich people to help us. So I brought a rich guy. Rich guy left in the industry. And the smart guy at the end of the show says to me, well, he should start working on something else because this is never going to work. And Jonathan. And I go up to Diane's hamburgers, you know, three days later, and say, like, what do you think? And I said, you have some great songs, but do you want to write a play? Or do you want to write a collage? Or the concert? Because right now you don't have a play. And I don't think he was happy with me. But he kept working. And then uh, got a Richard Rogers grant to do another workshop. So then in the uh, fall of 94, he did it again, and then I brought my partner, Kevin, who had never seen it. And when we saw that workshop, Kevin just flipped out and said, we have to do it. Intermission, he's like, we're doing the show. And um, and then we, you know, we did the hard, and then we teamed up with New York Theater Workshop to do the show. And during that whole process, Tommy, I was just hoping, you know, Maybe we could get a garage somewhere and set up 500 seats and do the show. I did. I had no um, conception yet that this would go to Broadway. Uh, and I don't think Jonathan did either. Um, you know, as he, so, you know, Jonathan died four hours after the first rehearsal. He did not ever see it performed before the came audience. The dress rehearsal was rocking. Like we had a full <clears throat> house, friends and family. And and, and it was rocking that night. But, um, um, so then we're in previews at the Interpreter Workshop. And you, I, I'm sure you've all experienced this when you do a show and people come up to you after and they are not exactly, they say words that you know are code for your show sucks and I'm really sorry to <laughs> <you> it. <laughs> Be careful of congratulations. <laughs> It was, it was literally, it was Ben Pasek who said to me two weeks ago, someone said to me, congratulations, and I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> I said, honey, I know. <laughs> um, in any event, so there were people in the previews in the Run Shop that were looking at me like, oh, I'm so sorry, your friend is dead, and your show's not very good. <laughs> um, and then there were other people, like Joe Mantello, who called me on the phone and said, you have the next four song. So I was buoyed by that. And, um, and this other things did start to happen when we started to feel like it was gelling and igniting. And you know, there is that moment, like you do the show for the first few shows and it's not yet gelling, and then it starts to congeal, and then it starts to create a new organism that's, um, that has a whole that is better than the sum of its parts. And as that started to happen, I was standing in the back of the theater workshop, which is a 150 seat theater. It does have a 40 foot uh, wide stage. And I thought, this has to go to Broadway. 
And after it opened and got great reviews off Broadway, I know that my business partner, Kevin, and I said, damn the torpedoes, we are going to Broadway. And I thought, I don't know if this will work on Broadway, but if this won't work on Broadway, I don't think I'm going to be able to work on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And so our old, and I was 31 years old, I had never produced a Broadway show. I was making my living as a booking agent, booking the tour of Sound of Music starring Marie Austin. <laughs> really. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I didn't like booking the tour of Sound of Music starring Marie Austin, but it made it, it, it paid for the rent. And you know what else all that those bookings paid for? Right. Rent. <laughs> That's how Kevin and I were able to finance it downtown. We used our booking money. I didn't have any money. I didn't have you know, we needed to come up with $150,000. We found one rich guy to put up half of it, and then we had to put up seventy-five. Or uh, is it yeah, we had to put up like so. We 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 financed it thirty-seven five each from our booking agency. I had to get thirty-seven thousand dollars in my bank account. I was thirty-one years old. I didn't know. And um, and we had this fervor that we needed to do rent on Broadway, even though our um, more experienced Broadway advisors were saying to us, the audience that wants to see Rent doesn't go to Broadway, and the audience that goes to Broadway ain't gonna come see Rent. Mm -hmm. And we thought, we're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> and they ran 12 years. Mm -hmm. Well, and you and Kevin created the student rush. Yes, yeah, so, you know, we were 31 years old. Um, we were gonna do a show on Broadway. We're trying to figure out how to price it. And one of the things we realized is that if we go off Broadway, we only have 500 seats, but if we go to Broadway and we have 1,100 seats, we can make a lot of seats the full price, but we can also make a lot of seats a lot less. Mm -hmm. And we thought that will actually make the show more accessible to more people at a cost that they can afford. So um, we did two things. One is that we created um, a system where we charge whatever the, you know, at that point, the going rate for an orchestra seat on Broadway was, I think, 65 bucks. So we made the orchestra 65 bucks, but we made almost the entire balcony 35 bucks. And then what we did, there had already been rush tickets for like Miss Saigon on Broadway back then, but they were always in the back of the balcony and they were only for students. And we were like, students, by the way, I'm glad you're all students, I'm glad you get them. But I was 31 years old, I still couldn't afford a ticket. <laughs> like, you're going to find this out too. You're going to be out in New York and you're going to be like, I can't afford a ticket and I'm not a student anymore. And we wanted to be sensitive to those people. Um, so we thought we're going to do a $20 ticket. We're going to make it for everybody, not just students. And we're not going to put it in the back of the balcony. We're going to put it in the first row. Mm -hmm. And we'll create, and it was like, so then we created this thing, you know, how to pay the rent. Cash, you know, 20 bucks cash only at the door two hours before the show. And on April 15th, 1996, it was raining. It was chilly out. We're like, what are you doing for the show? Up for yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, and there, and there were 34 seats. So that's like 17 pairs. And there were enough people to, and they bought those tickets. And of course, every day that line at the Nederland on 41st Street, and by the way, uh, in 1996, 41st Street was really, really rough in there, mm -hmm. there was. And, uh, and every day that line got longer. And by the summer of 97, you would have three lines on Friday, which is the line for Friday night at 8, the line for Saturday afternoon at 2, and the line for Saturday night at 8. And they were sleeping over for Saturday. <laughs> and these were kids sleeping over on 41st Street. And, and there was a moment Kevin and I were on the phone, and we're like, um, someone's going to die, <laughs> and we're going to be responsible. And we have to. And of course, you know what happens? Every great thing gets corrupted. So, you know, in a slight, um, uh, you know, its own little story of, um, uh, uh, I'll think of, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the, oh, the flea, the, the uh, you know, the, the novel, the kids that go to the island and become crazy. Lord, 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 you know, by that summer, you're in, you're like, kid, so there are some kids that are like kicking people offline, holding places for their friends, and got corrupted. So we created the lottery where you didn't have to show up in Santa Line. We just did the lottery two hours before the show. And for 12 years on Broadway, we would pull the name out of the hat. And what was so satisfying was that soon after Rent came, when we did Avenue Q in 2003, uh, we, had a, we had a lottery for that. And then, of course, when Wicked opened on Broadway, our, our friends and competitors who made that show, 
Uh, they started doing the lottery for Wicked, and no Hairspray right. started. No, I know. Well, the grudge is on them because we beat them for best musical. <laughs> <laughs> and I assure you, they still have it. <laughs> Which gives me intense pleasure. <laughs> 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 Uh, we can talk about that because that may have been the funnest night of my life. <laughs> uh, but um, everybody started doing this lot. You know, Hairspray did it, and Wicked did it, and um, and that was so satisfying that we were making Broadway accessible to young people. And I think that was helping to create a new culture on Broadway. I think two things happened. One was that was helpful, and I and I think Rent was helpful in creating a new culture on Broadway that literally led to In the Heights and Next to Normal and Dear Evan Hansen, which was, and, and, what, and what, you know, people ask me in the years after Red Open, is this going to create rock musicals again on Broadway? And I said, hey, I don't know, but I doubt it. But what it did create is an environment where artists could take big risks mm -hmm. and where artists started to write shows about contemporary topics and contemporary characters. And um, it is one of the pleasures of my that my friend and colleague, Lynn Manuel, says that when he went to see Rent as a high school senior at Hunter High School with his girlfriend and he sat in the balcony for 35 bucks, he looked on that stage and he said, oh, I can write about my neighborhood and about my people. And his sophomore project at Wesleyan was a little one-act musical that he directed and didn't star in yet called In the Heights. And, um, and that makes me feel good. <laughs> Speaking of and that one more, Hamilton, I mean, how, how many, I'm going to assume all the hands are going to go up when I ask how many are familiar. That's <laughs> what I expected. Um, what, was, what was the, I guess similar to the red question, what was the moment that you realized that this was something that needed to be shared on a grander scale? Um, do you know how, um, I said to you a little bit earlier, I don't know why I'm so emotional this morning. <laughs> I don't know what's going on this morning, but I feel like I'm, I, 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 I'm, yeah, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling very deeply this morning. I'm um, not even full of our Walter time. <laughs> Nor did you. Okay. Um, and, uh, and I will not define myself as a tree. <laughs> Um, they don't even know because she's so old now. <laughs> <laughs> you, you <laughs> uh, I said to you a little bit ago, Jonathan said he wanted to do Lava and the East Village in the United States, and what did I say? Yes. My job as a producer is to nurture the playwright, <clears throat> nurture the composer, nurture the lyricist, the director, the set designer, the lighting designer, and everything. It starts with the closer, playwright. Lynn said to, you know, Lynn, shortly after uh, In the Heights got going, um, started to get this idea on vacation. I mean, this is to give you some idea of what Lynn is like. You know, he, he finally goes on his first real vacation with his girlfriend, Vanessa, uh, after, you know, he gets a vacation from playing with Sonavi on Broadway in the Heights. He goes to the bookstore. He sees this, you know, 1,000 page book mm -hmm. about a guy named Alexander Hamilton. He buys it to read in Mexico. <laughs> is that the book you read at the pool in Mexico? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he gets this idea that Alexander Hamilton is a, is a hip hop guy. <laughs> and, uh, and he does a song at the White House in the spring of 09, in the very early stages of our beloved Obama presidency. <laughs> 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 We're going to 
to get it back. <laughs> you're going to help. We're going to deliver this again. We're not going to let 10,000 votes keep us away again. <laughs> I'll come back. <laughs> I think we're safe in New York. You can vote. <laughs> vote early and vote often. <laughs> um, what else on Travis, right? <laughs> What am I talking about? <laughs> uh, that the, the, the thing that you saw in Hamilton. Oh, right. So Rim said, so then he thought he was going to write a hip hop album. And I said, great. You know, I'm like, I'll go with wherever you want to go. And my job is to often let the artist figure it out. And he was writing very slow at first. You know, he'd write a song every year, basically. And, um, and it was, you know, at that point, um, Lynn and Tommy Cal and I had developed a real close uh, uh, camaraderie. You know, com uh, we were comrades, we were friends. And um, Tommy told me he was going to get Lynn to do a cycle of songs of Hamilton at, at um, Lincoln Center at this cabaret club they have. And I think Tommy was secretly hoping if he could get Lynn to just write 10 songs in a row, he could then convince <laughs> Lynn it's a musical and not an album. And so they did that in uh, January of 2012. And after that, I said, well, that's a musical, you know, and everybody knew that was a musical. And then Lynn said, yes, that's a musical. I said, okay, so let's go write a musical, but I still want to do the hip hop album first. And I just said, great, we will, I'll do whatever you want. You want me to pay for it? We'll pay for whatever. And, um, and then we hired a, uh, playwright because we thought he would need a book writer. He wanted a book writer. We hired a cool guy. And uh, and they started working for about six months together. You know what I was doing? I was literally making them like egg salad at my house <laughs> um, so that they could have a little retreat for three days to start working it out. Sometimes your job's to cook. <laughs> and uh, and then um and then we did a a, a read a, just a very small reading for me, like it was me and Tommy and and Lynn was, you know, uh, singing maybe Alexander Hamilton, maybe Burr, I don't know. And uh, I know that by that first one, I think we had Doug Mead already, Tommy had already uh, knew Doug Mead and we were flying to be on JetBlue from Oakland to help uh, help us do these readings. And, uh, and we read, and the first time we ever read through it, every time they stopped rapping and started talking, died. Just die. And after that reading, I said, "We got to um, Lynn's got to write the whole thing. It's got to be sung through." And Tom was like, "Lynn's got to write the whole thing, sung through." So we got rid of um, the playwright. <laughs> and it wasn't an issue of his talent. The show didn't want to talk, and hopefully. He can ameliorate his feelings of grudge with the knowledge that it needed to wrap the whole thing. And um, and then we just started going. And uh, and you know, my job is to say yes. <laughs> and then sometimes my job is to say, can you do better? I have to say, um, it was often my job to say we have to do better within the heights. And the development, you know, in the Heights, we had to go down every single possible road, find the roadblock, hit the wall, come back, redo. Uh, you know, I think he wrote Nina's song, Breathe, eight or 10 or 12 times to try to get that number right in, uh, in the Heights. Um, trying to figure out what is the right opening number for Act 2 in the Heights. Trying to find out what is the right number for um, the funeral of the Guayla in the Heights. And somehow, Lynn wrote the opening number of Hamilton, and then it never changed. And then he wrote My Shot, and it never changed. It seemed like every number that came out of him uh, was hatched perfectly. And I give great credit to he and Tommy, who really was like his dramaturg on it, um, in fashioning that show one song at a time, uh, almost... Um, I feel like it was almost divine how like, you know God came through with him. It's, I think it, it may be as messianic as the birth of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
But I mean, I, don't, I could, I could continue asking kind of questions, but I want to make sure we have time for the students to ask too. Please. Uh, so I want to open it up to the floor. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand, speak loudly. There's a little venting happening, but yeah. What was the conversation and your reaction the first time somebody said, let's do a show with puppets? Ah, <laughs> great question. Um, you never know where your next show is going to come from. And uh, to put this in context, in the spring of 2000, I um, had, uh, I was in a total depression, or at least like a sad moment, because in that February, we had opened off Broadway, the entry was a wild party. And there was this, it was the craziest year on Broadway. There was another show of the exact same title with the exact same source material that was opening two months after us in what were like these wild party wars. Uh, the Michael John McCusa Wild Party and Flip Wild Party, and I was obviously with Kevin were uh, very much behind Andrews, and we got a crummy review in the Times. There was another one opening. We were hoping to move to Broadway that spring. We thought we would we thought we were, we thought we had a fantastic show. We were so proud of the show. And sometimes that one crummy review in the Times can stop you, so we didn't move it to Broadway. And I was crushed, crushed. And, um, you know, and I want to say something, and I don't bear a grudge about that. I just feel sad about that, mm -hmm. that you know, we didn't get to Broadway that year. And, um, and sometimes, you know, right out of that, um, sadness, I actually remember like falling asleep at my desk at some point after that. I was like, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I was still happy, you know, I had, um, Red running on Broadway, it was a big hit, and obviously all that, but it was sad. And um, and then my friend Robert Goodman said, Hey, I'm going to see this workshop of this this thing called Avenue Q with puppets. And they wanted to be a TV show, but it's written by these theater guys, Jeff Marks and Bobby Lopez. So you want to, you know, it's, and it was at a church on. Um, Oh, what's funny about it? Oh, that's not a church. church. <laughs> <laughs> the basement of that church that's at the City Corps building on Lexington Avenue and 50, uh, 50th Street, um, whatever church that is. And they have a basement theater that's probably about the same size as this. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they, they tell us they're developing a TV show and there's going to be some original songs. There's going to be some uh, uh, not original songs. And, um, and the puppets were like, they'd already created a, uh, a puppet for those those primary characters with this amazing puppet here named Rick Lyon. And uh and it's that is genuinely a collage, like a scene, a song, but that was the first time I heard if you were gay, that'd be okay because hey, I'd like you anyway. <laughs> and two puppets are singing it, I fell off my chair. <laughs> I don't feel like I hadn't left that long, certainly all that year and so much longer. And then before you know it, they're singing, everyone's a little bit racist. <laughs> I fell off my chair again. And uh, they definitely had those two songs. Oh, they had another song that I thought was just the funniest thing I've ever heard. Uh, they, it, didn't, it didn't last into the show. It was called, What Do the People in Your Neighborhood Make? I remember there was a Sesame Street song, What Do the People in Your Neighborhood Make? Like, what was your profession? And this was literally where two, two guys, Bobby and Jeff made a video of them going through the town and asking, like, the guy at the shoe store, the guy at the bodega, how much money do you make? <laughs> and the guy at the bodega's like, you know, I make $8, $6, $5 an hour. And then they conclude with going to an anesthesiologist who laughs and tells you, I can get some million dollars a year. <laughs> and then, literally, so that in that song, they're in the audience, and then they say, okay, everybody, now turn to the person to your right <laughs> and tell them how much money you make. And the audience screams. Of course, no, we <laughs> want to make people uncomfortable just asking how much money they make. And um, this one thing that in America everybody's obsessed with and everybody's afraid to talk about. And um, so then uh, I, and then by the way, and then like the Kate Monster puppets saying, Not a Day Goes By from Nearly You Roll Along. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. And and then uh, if any of you know the songs of Marcy and Zena, you know the Taylor the Latte Boy. <laughs> they also did Taylor the Latte Boy. She sang that song too. 
you know, so it was like a puppet singing about the latte boy at Starbucks. And so it was a totally adorable thing, and they wanted to make it a TV show. And I, and I met them, and I went uh, out into the little lobby after, and they wanted to meet me because Jeff Marks was in Michigan. And I meet Bobby and Jeff, and they're like, hey, happy to meet you. Uh, and I said, well, you know, good luck, and if you ever decide to not make a TV show and, and make a uh, musical, give me a call. And then, you know, they called about five days later. <laughs> <laughs> they came to my office, and uh, and then we said, well, can we now make this into a proper two-act musical with a beginning, a middle, and an end? And... Uh, and then the other conversation, and then, because they have these amazing, funny songs, <clears throat> but I also remember that I said to them after they brought in their first batch of really funny songs, I said, but can you write a love song? Mm -hmm. And can you write a song that is genuinely from the heart? Because if you can't write that, we can't make a musical. And, uh, you know, three weeks later, they brought in It's a Fine, Fine Line. Mm -hmm. And it moved me, and I said, okay, now we can make a music. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> oh, right, that was it. So, so I got I love Avenue Q. And here's the cue. And I want to also define that what makes Avenue Q tick is not just the laughs. And it's one of the funniest shows that's ever been written on Broadway. And some people will tell you it's still even funnier than The Book of Mormon, which is also a funny, funny, funny <laughs> show, um, is that it's the heart. And by the way, same thing true at Book of Mormon. It's not just the laughs or the satire, because you can't support an entire show on satire. It gets it gets boring. It's the heart. And um, I love that. I always say about Avenue Q, I used to say about like my musicals, Avenue Q, uh, in the Hides, Rent, that Avenue Q is the perfect musical. <laughs> and uh, Hamilton is too now. But Avenue Q, perfect musical. Love it. Thanks. Next. Yeah. Uh, for anyone aspiring to write a play or a musical, what do you? What are some of the things that like the producer looks for? Do you think I should put inside of their musical? Yeah, play? their heart. Right. I'm looking for your heart as an artist. Um, I don't know. Well, the answer is I don't know. It's not for me. It's for you, the writer, to tell me what I want with your inspiration. Because um, I have done four musicals that were wildly successful that all won the Tony, and not one of them was my idea. I'm looking for the playwright to tell me what the great idea is. And, I'm, and then what I'm looking for is, does it move me in my heart? And, you know, people present me a lot of things that I pass on, and I say, I'd like to go see it, but I don't want to um, adopt it. <laughs> and I have to want to adopt it and make it my child in order for me to do it. And I know that that answer is a little fuzzy, but it is the true answer. <clears throat> Mr. Seller, thank you so much for your narrative today and spending the time with us. Mm -hmm. The first part of your story elaborate on the public school system and how that gave you an inspiration to continue down your path with you. Mm -hmm. Do you support any kind of public school program like that to inspire kids? I ask because I come from a high school that didn't have a theater program. I started theater very late in my undergrad and I worked myself through quite a nice career. In your philanthropy, do you support stuff, anything like that? Yeah, well, I'm doing. Uh, uh, two things directly, and of course one indirectly. Uh, one is that I'm now supporting, I'm sorry I'm forgetting their name, but in Cincinnati, the like that thespian society that does theater all over the country. Step ahead, start. Um, we almost were involved in that. We what were, are they uh, called? Head start. No, it's not Head Start. But no, no, it's, um, it's a fascinating program where schools, um, Jeffrey actually paid for an entire one. It's a, it's a generous well, gift. one in Detroit, I think. Get, uh, it's going to align with the University of Michigan because we don't have to right. uh, producing theater with the education. We so do. I'm supporting a program that's going to break theater into middle schools um, that don't have theater programs, number one. Uh, so I made that commitment last year through the Thespian Society. I just don't remember what they're called, but their home office is in Cincinnati. 
And mm -hmm. um, so that's number one. And then number two is um, here in Detroit for the last 25 years, we've had the Mosaic Group Theater, mm -hmm. which is not associated with the Detroit Public Schools, but it um, caters 100% to Detroit public school students who come to their after school theater program, uh, which is uh, right down here, not far from here, um, where they have their own half of the school um, every day. It's um, And it's an after school theater program that is rigorous, um, that goes from like 3.30 to like 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night. And um, it's run by an incredible man named Rick Sperling. 95% of the students who participate in that program go on to complete a four year college education. And, uh, and I've just made a huge commitment to Mosaic because I wanted to support um, kids, theater, and the uh, city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One or two more. Um, uh, kind of actually ties into some of the same things here, uh, specifically Hamilton, um, because of its phenomenal success and it's become this cultural touchstone or something. You can even call it the cultural sidekicks of the time. Uh, does it bear a stronger response or a heavier responsibility to ensure access for new, younger audience, um, potential lifelong theater goers than that um, previous shows necessarily um, their efforts? Uh, does it have a larger responsibility to ensure access to that? I hope that question makes sense. <laughs> yes, it makes perfect sense, and it's a great question. Um, I want to preface my comment by saying that um, that has been an important value to me, going all the way back to it, and that with Hamilton being the story of America yesterday told by America today, right, told by a group of actors who are African-American, Latino, Asian-American, white, of every um, shape and color, and it being the story of our founding as a country, um, it felt like the responsibility was greater. And um, from the moment we made the decision to go to Broadway, Tommy and Lynn and I talked about the necessity of having an education program. And uh, we created an education program in Hamilton in which we bring, um, in New York City, 20,000 kids a year from the Title I public schools to Hamilton for $10 each. And then on top of it, they engage in a very rigorous American history curriculum in the weeks leading up to the performance, mm -hmm. then they also create their own performance pieces that are um, inspired by the story, the characters, um, the time, the place, and, they can, and, and it could be a poem, a hip hop, a dance, a scene, a song, a monologue, could be anything. And that program started with 20,000 Kids in New York has grown to be a program in which we're going to serve 250,000 kids throughout the United States of America between 2017 and 2020, and we raised $25 million to pay for that program. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought that was essential. And then with our Hamilton Education Program, we're actually going to um, start our, what we call the 2.0 program in another year, or year and a half. The pilot's going to start this fall, where teachers from all over the country, regardless of whether they're seeing the show, can do that program with their kids in their classroom. You know, they, the music's free on, um, on uh, you know, a streaming anyway, whether it's Spotify or what have you, so that that um, Hamilton education program can go in any classroom, regardless if they're even going to see the show. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it's our opportunity to both educate kids about American history and to also show kids, all kids, that that's my story too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But we can do another question from my perspective. Okay. Uh, you're well. Um. It seems like Hamilton, well, it doesn't seem like it's obvious that Hamilton has changed like the American theater landscape and what that means outside of New York and in cities across the country. And it kind of feels like 
theater, musical theater, regular theater, opera, performing arts, it's like almost the wild west again. <laughs> so like, what do you see long term the impact of this like renewed interest in American theater being not just in New York, but like, you know, some small Midwest town or San Francisco or Alaska, like outside of Hamilton's direct influence? Like, do you have any of your own ideas about where we're headed? You know, I am uh, devoted personally to the musical theater form. I consider myself um, a student of the American musical. Um, trying to make a musical is always impossible, even after you've made a great one. And if you look at the track records of Rodgers and Hammerstein or any great composer, you know, every time we try it again, we seem to be amateurs coming up to the play and trying to learn from the past as we forge the future. Um, not sure how it will turn out. Um, I think that, I think two things. I think theater is thriving in America um, for a few reasons. One is that I think that in this digital age and in this age in which all of us are addicted in one way or another to the phone and to uh, what's on that screen in front of us, we have a concomitant need to get out and come into a space like this and see people live, feel people on this stage who are telling a story that we can relate to. And um, though the digital revolution has um, pounded um, the recording business and it is playing its own havoc with the movie business and all that other stuff, um, I think that our business, they can't take away. Because this human need to tell stories and hear stories together in the room, I believe, is constant. And I think it's even more important now. And um, I, I really appreciate your notion that Hamilton is opening that world up even larger. I would not be um, uh, one to take credit for it or think that that's necessary. I don't know if that's happening. Um, I would like to think that that's happening. I know that um, as Hamilton is touring all over America, um, my local presenters are telling me that they are getting people to come to the theater that have never been to the theater before. And I love that. And I think just like Rent did in 1996, Hamilton will double down on the notion that artists can take bold risk and follow their hearts. And then once in a while, create a great work of art that embraces all of us and encourages all of us to participate in its performance. Thank you. That's such a great closing moment. <laughs> <laughs> How we top that? Uh, we thank you, Captain. It's my pleasure. What a pleasure to be wonderful. Sure. And uh, so generous of your time. Thank you all for being here and being part of this. I appreciate your questions. I know we couldn't get to everybody. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions. It will not be necessarily the same answer to every house, but that's why I'm here. Um, but thank you all. This was really remarkable. This is a unique opportunity for you to hear from somebody that's really making impeccable strides in this business. Um, and somebody that you can inspire to be or to inspire to. Go beyond. Mm -hmm. Please go beyond. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you again.